the program overall is called Neighbors, Friends and Family, meaning that no one should be a bystander, that one does not have to be intimately involved in a family to be able to say something when you see something. This iteration of the Neighbors, Friends and Family program um, started in 2015. The first funding came in 2016. The impetus for the Neighborhoods, Friends and Family really was to ensure that we were raising community awareness around violence against women, but more importantly that we were providing information just in case there were women who were experiencing intimate partner violence so they would know what resources existed in the communities, um, as well as to begin to um, break the silence around violence against women in, in, our, in our immigrant and refugee communities, to provide a space for women and men to be able to speak about relationships and relationship dynamics, and more importantly, how do we stop it? How do we end it? How do we empower women so that they're able to leave violent um, situations? How do we empower um, people involved in same gender relationships so that they're able to speak out and to find the kind of support that they may require. In 2018, as an example, within the first six months, we had 78 women um, reported as having died from domestic violence, um, not necessarily intimate partner violence, but domestic violence, so killed by someone to whom they're related or who they know. Um, that, that proved to us that there is a crisis and an ongoing um, crisis. Out of those 78 women, a number of those women were indigenous, but a number were also coming from immigrant and refugee families. The chief coroner in Ontario found that in most cases where a woman was killed in a case of domestic violence, there was a neighbor, friend, or family member who knew what was going on but didn't know how to help. So out of that came the Neighbors, Friends and Families campaign, saying, okay, let's teach neighbors, friends and families, you know, what the warning signs of abuse are, how to support someone living with abuse, so we can change the direction of these really horrible cases. We developed a champion's model. We felt that the immigrant and refugee community is so broad and so diverse, we needed different approaches depending on the community. Um, and, and so the champion's model may, allows us then to identify folks who are interested, um, who've been doing work in the area, who have a sound analysis, uh, feminist analysis around VAW, and to work with them, to train them on some of the issues around violence against women, and to provide them with resources so then they go out into their specific communities and hold events, um, have talks, um, find ways of bringing women, and in many instances, men together to talk about some of these issues. This program isn't about experts coming in from the outside and quote-unquote educating immigrant and refugee communities about domestic violence and preventing violence against women. It's coming from the community itself. In immigrant and refugee communities, especially when you think about things like um, people abusing someone who doesn't have immigration status, family violence where in-laws are involved, like there are, it's more complex uh, because our communities are complex, right? And so by having peer champions from these communities, they can really tease out those conversations and, and help people really see what's going on in their, own, in their own lives and in the lives of people around them. We're very specific on the way uh, how we select peer champions. Uh, we try to um, uh, bring into the peer champions the people who are already leaders in the community, the ones that are already uh, the voices of who everybody trusts in that community. We invite them to be part of the campaign by us training them and giving them the knowledge and the tools to prevent and support people who are experiencing domestic violence. They go back to their community and they are disseminating that knowledge, that knowledge and supporting their community. After we've trained the peer champions on the content in terms of violence against women and how to hold educational um, initiatives. Uh, they, we are then have an expectation that they will go out into the community and hold at least two events per year. By event, you know, we don't mean that we're uh, looking to see peer champions uh, run a huge gala or anything like that. You know, for us, an event is any educational intervention in the community. So it could be visiting a language instruction class and giving a workshop there. It could be uh, visiting a women's group that's uh, already running and giving a workshop there. Uh, visiting a, a faith community and giving a talk, right? So it's not about uh, creating something new so much as building on what's already there in the community and bringing 
awareness about domestic violence, um, the warning signs, and how to support someone who's living in, with abuse into the community sp spaces that already exist. With some communities, when we invite them to events, uh, we need to be very uh, mindful of how to name and how to frame the event. Uh, in some communities, violence is such a taboo topic that if we say in the name of the event, violence, gender-based violence, or anything, or domestic violence, more than likely people are not going to come. So we call events self-care, let's create stronger communities, come for tea and yoga, come for a crafty afternoon, and then we engage the conversation. Yes, we're going to be doing craft todays, but craft is about self-care, and self-care also means taking care of each other and also means keeping everybody safe. And then after we say that, we go on with the powerful presentation, we talk about what is domestic violence, what is abuse and all that. So over the last five, five years or so, we've seen um, women come together to hold in sewing circles. We've seen um, imams come together to talk about how it is that they can raise issues of violence um, in the mosques. Um, we've seen other groups of young women come together and put on um, an evening, whether or not it's a play or, or it's, it's some sort of lecture on violence against women. We've seen senior women um, come together in a exercise club and the topic of conversation is about violence against women. To support the Peer Champions event, there's a, an honorarium that we provide. We give them uh, $1,000 to support that work. Um, so if they're visiting um, a center or a class, they can provide refreshments, they can print handouts, um, they can pay honorarium to a guest speaker they might want to invite. So that's how we support their their work. The training for the peer champions, it covers everything from a framework of anti-racism, anti-oppression to set the stage and how we run the program. Then it also has different components. The first one is to um, how to understand how violence um, affect immigrant and refugee communities and what are the signs of abuse, what kind of abuse we see with immigrant and refugee communities how to support people, how to find support for people who are experiencing violence. Also on the training is how to run community events, how to connect with agencies, faith organizations, and group of people who can support the work of the peer champion. We have peer champions complete online courses on gender-based violence, um, online webinars, um, before attending a full day in-person training event. When peer champions meet together for the full day, um, at that point, we feel that peer champions have achieved a, a certain standard of, of knowledge about um, the campaign, what the warning signs are, what the supports are that they need to be sharing with their community. So we spend uh, more time on the in-person training day in really workshopping and um, helping peer champions think through the event planning. What will it look like? How do I how do I engage my specific community? Another really important part of the training day is to give peer champions as many resources as possible for them to be able to hit the ground running with their events. So what we do is we provide them with a template a workshop that covers the basics of the Neighbors, Friends and Families campaign, uh, domestic violence in, in immigrant and refugee communities. We also give them a lot of sample activities, including um, arts-based activities of drawing out scenarios of abuse and facilitating discussion. We have a card series called Which Would You Choose, which has um, two different scenarios in it, one healthy and one abusive, but not obviously abusive, because we want people to start thinking about warning signs before things get very serious. So one of the scenarios shows someone um, whose husband is preventing her from speaking to her sister. Like, I don't like when you talk to her, right? And so that scenario then can start a conversation about what does isolation look like? Because we know in cases of domestic violence, isolation is huge, you know, that's a huge component. One really great part of the training day is we just give peer champions a lot of templates, you know, so a template letter if you're approaching an organization for a partnership. We give them um, template evaluation forms if they choose to use evaluations at their event. We also give them a very comprehensive list of resources for survivors of domestic uh, violence and sexual assault in Ontario. The fact is, when it comes to learning about violence against women and preventing domestic violence, 
It is a very intensive, lifelong learning process. We encourage peer champions to stay connected and constantly be learning, even after the training is complete, um, by taking um, you know, online courses, attending events, staying in touch with the coordinator, and, and communicating with each other. So that's what we really encourage. The trainings were evaluated with the evaluation form that uh, anonymously was uh, distributed to all the peer champions participating. The evaluation form uh, looked at different categories, the, the different goals of the training. So, um, knowledge on domestic violence, uh, you know, building a sense of team and supportive community, for example, uh, confidence in running an event. We evaluate materials, we, uh, and with their support and their feedback, we make sure that we're covering any new communities for the next cohort, that we are uh, translating all the materials to the languages that we need to translate, that uh, the support, the training, and the honorarium they get is enough to run events. Uh, if they need more training or more support, running events. If they need more connections with agencies or not. So that's the kind of the feedback that they give us every year before we build up the curriculum and the program for the next cohort of peer champions. We also evaluate and we do a very simple um, questionnaires and interviews with uh, people who attend events. We're asking them if what they understood for, uh, of what it was gender-based violence or domestic violence has changed. If they learn anything, if they think that somebody they know is being in an abusive situation, if they have the tools to identify that, to check with the person and to support them and give them the information they need to make the best decision. We do have good statistics that say that after events, attendees feel that they, let's say 80% of them, um, feel that they uh, now have a good grasp and understanding of what it is domestic violence and how it is spe uh, specifically affect newcomers community. Uh, they also, 85% of them, after the event, they feel that now they have the tools to be active in terms of supporting people who are, being in, who are experiencing abuse and how to identify abuse. When it comes to evaluation of events, we do leave that up to the individual peer champion to decide whether they want to use evaluation forms at their event or not. The way that the peer champion model is set up is that we do encourage creativity and tailoring an event to a community so that it feels comfortable for people to have real conversations. So if a peer champion makes the call that, look, evaluation forms are gonna take away from that, they don't use them, but a lot of them have. I mean, yeah, and so the feedback that peer champions have received has been overwhelmingly positive, that the events have uh, helped community members improve their knowledge on the warning signs of domestic violence, how to support someone who's living with abuse, and knowledge of resources in their community. We think that uh, the program will work well in remote communities and rural areas. Agencies who need to bridge uh, the newcomers community first and work with them to identify who can be the peer champion, get to know who they are, what the needs of the community are, what the main languages, what the obstacles they face to meet. What is the history and the tradition in that community around domestic violence and learn from there and work with them to make the program accessible for them. The rest can very easily. We have created training materials, evaluation forms, educational um, campaign materials that are already um, translated to more than 10 languages. Ocasio also have learning tools on the subject of gender-based violence that, can also, that are also available for everybody. If the program is going to be implemented in a bigger city, um, something similar to Toronto, let's say Vancouver, our recommendation is that the program is break down in small specific groups. We want to consider who are the population, mem the population in your city, uh, who are the different community groups, and connect with people serving those different com uh, communities and find people who can be peer champions and create events and 
tailor the program to work with that community. We um, believe that the Peer Champion program and the model as it is, it can be transferable to any other community who are also facing uh, isolation and oppression and some kind of violence and abuse. Uh, here at Kasi we have the same peer, cha peer champion model for the um, accessibility of newcomers and for the um, for positive spaces so for LGBTQ uh, plus uh, community as well all that between the newcomers communities. The partner organizations are really key for this program because it's community-based. Uh, we have community members uh, that need space and resources in order to hold events in their communities, right? So without settlement agencies and other partner organizations lending a hand in terms of, you know, uh, offering their space for events, um, creating partnerships that make sense for the specific cultural communities that are being engaged in the work. Uh, without that role that they play, I, I don't think the program would be successful. I think the most powerful part of the Neighbors, Friends and Families Peer Champion Program is the fact that it's community-led. You know, really it, it, amazing people have uh, been attracted to this program because what it does is it empowers them and gives them additional resources to keep doing the work that they're already doing it values their expertise and it and it recognizes that when it comes to addressing and preventing domestic violence it has to be a community uh, based solution all of the community has to be involved and so by empowering community members to mobilize their whole community around this issue um, that's a very, very powerful method. I think that one of the best things that we did here in Ontario over the last five years was to center violence against women um, as, a, as a policy priority um, across communities, whether or not we're speaking about the immigrant and refugee uh, serving community, whether or not we ser we're talking about indigenous communities or the broader mainstream white community, um, violence against women has been put on everyone's agenda. And I think that for us in the longer term, what we hope will happen as we see new generations of women and young men coming, coming forward is that we will no longer be seeing the number of women who are being killed through intimate partner violence uh, on a daily basis. And we will begin to see these kinds of conversations happening everywhere, whether or not it's being part of our school curriculum, whether or not it's happening in, in places of worship, it's happening in our community centers where groups are gathering. Um, but we must continue to talk about violence against women and we're, we're hoping that in the long term it leads to the elimination of, 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 of violence in intimate partner relations.